Come on, won't you give God one more hand of praise for this choir? There is nothing like the endowment of the Holy Spirit. He has the ability to not only change your life, but change your direction. His responsibility is to change our minds and to fill us with the insight that we might stay in line with the will of God for our lives. Before I do the salutations, won't you allow me to invite the presence of the Spirit of God to lead us today? Even when we offer our salutations, it ought to be anointed by the Spirit of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you and we are humbled that you would even allow us to be here today. There are those who desire to wake up this morning and they did not. But you have seen fit to give us one more day to worship you and to praise you. And so we lift our hearts, our minds, and our hands to you, for you deserve it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Sharon. It is such a pleasure to be here to your bishop, who is my best friend in the world, to his lovely wife, Lynn. Girl, I haven't seen you in so long. I'm loving the hair. <laughs> to the officers, members, and friends, to my youngest son who came up from Jersey. Corey, stand up for a moment. This is, this is, so don't mess with me. He's 6'6". So don't mess around because got little wolves in the corner. Uh, to these young ladies who ministered so well on the floor, give them a hand of praise. I have known your pastor and this church for over 40 years, and this is top-notch stuff here. I don't even know if I can preach after that introduction. I'm like, who is that guy? Um, but I was talking to pastor. I, I've known Bishop for a minute, and I knew he was a man of prayer. And so when I was heading to the airport Friday, we were talking, and he says, is there anything I, I need to do for you? I said, yeah, please, just pray that it doesn't snow. I'm wondering if his prayer life is suspect because, <clears throat> because whenever he comes to Florida, I make sure it doesn't snow. It has... <laughs> Not to belabor the point, if you have your Bibles, won't you meet me in the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 and Romans chapter 28, I mean chapter 8. As was mentioned in the bio, I have degrees in biblical studies and theology, and one of the things I, that drove me to studying biblical studies and theology and African American studies is why would Africans become Christians? I mean, there are ethnic groups like the Igbo and the Yoruba, the Ashanti, the Iwe. They have their own religious perspectives. Matter of fact, my, my dissertation in the book I'm writing is about suicide by drowning as a form of resistance. And we discovered that there were various West and West Central African ethnic groups who believed if they died in the water, their spirit would go back to Africa. So what was it about Christianity that drove them, that drew them to one another? And I had a difficult time answering that question, and then God spoke to me, and he says in chapter Jeremiah 29, verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, <laughs> declares the Lord, to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and future. That's the front door of the conversation. The back door is in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together. That all things work together. Even the not so good things are in the process of working together 
for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, for those who for he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For we know that even the category bad things are part of, I know the plans I have for you. You may be seated. So I want to talk about, just for a few moments, from this tag, if you will, prayer, the key to success, colon, acquiring a spiritual alignment. Prayer, the key to success. I want to argue that prayer is not simply something that we do in crisis. For many of us, the only time we cry, cry out to God is when something's going wrong. When someone is ill, as a matter of fact, God becomes this missionary that we send to the hospital to heal someone, or we send to the university to pay tuition, or we send, and I want to argue that prayer is not something that we do, prayer is something that we live. It, it must become a part of your everyday evaluation of every single step that I, that I take. I want to suggest to you that prayer uh, is a sign of one's commitment to your destiny. In other words, if in fact God has a plan for you, how will you know what the plan is? You can't Google it. It's not on TikTok. You won't find it on IG. You won't find it on Facebook. The only way you can find it is to ask God. And yet, the only time we see God is in the midst of crisis. The Bible is very clear in John chapter 8, verses 27 and following. Jesus said, I, I always do those things that bring glory to the Father. I always do those things that honor the... I always... How is it possible, Jesus, to always do what God wants you to do? He prayed. Every single moment of his life was a part of his prayer. He understood that if he was going to be successful to reach his destiny, he had to be in constant, consistent connection with the will and the voice of God. The problem is we try to align our destinies with God's destinies, and then we figure out a way to put God into the process. God, I really want to go to this, to this store right now. And God says, no, don't go just now because it's about to rain. And you go anyway. Next thing you know, it's raining. The Holy Spirit serves as our GPS system. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to ensure that your will and my will are aligned with the will of God. And oftentimes, we short-circuit it because we think that we know more about what we're doing and where we're going than God does. We assume that success is based on acquisition, so we pray about stuff like cars and houses and people and places, when in fact what we should be praying is, God, am I going in the right direction? See if I can help you. So I, I ride a motorcycle. Um... And a few, during the Christmas holidays, my wife and I spent Christmas in Orlando. On the way home, on the freeway, I see a sign that says, Titusville 408 East, which is a road, it's a freeway. <clears throat> so if I take the, the Florida Turnpike to 408 East, I could take 408 East, 408 East to Titusville. A few, few weeks later, I'm headed down to Titusville to meet with some frat brothers of mine who also ride motorcycles. And my GPS on the bike says, go north. Now, I know I had to go south to get to Orlando. GPS says, go north. Obviously, I know better than the GPS, so I don't go north. I jump on the freeway. And traffic is backed up for 21 miles going south. So as I'm 
Going down the freeway at two or three miles an hour, I realized that about 14 miles later, it was trying to get me to go off of Route 40, which takes us all the way down to Daytona, make a right at 95 and go right to Titusville. I know that because when I got caught in the rain with the bishop one night, that's the route it brought me home on. Here's the point. God's GPS sometimes tells us to go north when we think we ought to go south. And the next thing you know, we're stuck in traffic because we think we know more than God does. But if, in fact, he knows the plan that he has for us, he also has a direction for us to get to the plan. So what does that mean? I know the plans I have for you. If, you. if you have both those texts in front of you, one of the operative words in both texts is the word no. Jeremiah 29 says, for I know, God says. Romans says, and we know. Which means there's, this, this word no is ultimate, oftentimes used as a, a word of intimacy. It's the idea of a, a relationship that is bound by trust and commitment. It's, it's the idea, it's, it's kind of what happens between a husband and a wife when they know one another. That's what he's saying. And he's arguing in, in, in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Well, why is he saying that? Well, because contextually, they're in bondage. They are... Uh, in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar because they were disobedient. And they're concerned that God has left them. So God sends Jeremiah to them to say, listen, don't be concerned about your circumstances. Build houses, marry, plant things, grow plants, because after 70 years, the plan will fulfill itself. In other words, you have to understand that all things, including the bad things, are part of God's plan because there's a lesson you learn when life goes crazy. You cannot afford to walk with God and not allow him to give you a test. You can't have a testimony without a test. I know the plans I have for you. Well, are, is he writing the plans down now? Of course he's not. The plans are already done. Remember, God's omniscient. God knows everything perfectly. God knows everything that's happening tomorrow, yesterday, this week, and now at the same time. God is not limited by time. The problem with God is God doesn't wear a watch. He's not limited by minutes, seconds, and hours. And so therefore, God sees your future, your present, and your past at the same time. So we have to trust that in the process of all things working for our good, that is part of his plan. Don't deviate from the plan. Well, how do I know that? Could you argue that LeBron James is successful? Makes $51 million a year. Would you argue that um, Mahomes is successful? Sure he would. But the moment you get into the kingdom, the narratives of success changes. We know that because in Luke chapter 11, the disciples said to Jesus, won't you teach us how to pray? Now notice, they seen him walk on water. They seen him raise the dead. They seen him give sight to the blind. They did not ask him to teach them how to do miracles. They asked him to teach us how to pray. Why? Because they recognized that every time he prayed, something happened in the alignment of his destiny. And for many of us, we see prayer as this add-on thing. When in fact, it ought to be the very thing that motivates you to get up. 
I, I'm, I'm a tennis player. I play a USTA player, and, and because I'm a player, I watch tennis videos. I read tennis books. I take tennis lessons. I do drills because I want to be a player. If you are a man or woman of God and you want to be a prayer, you've got to read books on prayer. You've got to get lessons on prayer. You've got to spend time in prayer. You've got to be around people who pray. So that prayer is not an add-on, but it is who, be, who you are becoming to be. Why? Because if prayer is truly the alignment of the will of God, Jesus is the perfect example. Going back to the the athletes, they're successful, but would you say Jesus was successful? Sure he was. He said on the cross, it was finished. So what was finished? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to the disciples, come on over here and pray with me for a minute. And he walks away and they go to sleep. But while he's praying, he says, Father, this cup it's devastating. He'd already seen the future. He already knew what the cross was. That's why he had to protect Malchus when Peter cut his ear off. Because he could not get killed in a riot because Peter cut this man's ear off because he had to get to, his destiny was the cross. So he says, if there's any way for this cup to pass, let it pass. And then he says this. Not my will, but thy will be done. Alignment. Your prayer life ought to be an attempt at a consistent alignment of your will with the will of God, even when that will is uncomfortable. You cannot run from the uncomfortable stuff in your life. Sometimes it's sickness. Sometimes it's one of those crazy kids. Sometimes it's a spouse that is just unruly. Sometimes it's someone on your job. Sometimes you're driving down the freeway and you know that that person cut you off and you could give them the one finger salute, but you elect not to because that wouldn't will up with the <laughs> that wouldn't line up with the will of God. I can't cuss up in here. It's a church, but you know what I'm trying to say to you. You must understand that the reason that the disciples, watch this, the reason the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray is because he already told them what he wanted them to do. And they knew they couldn't do it if they hadn't heard from God. Miracles didn't mean a thing if you're outside the will of God. Watch this. Even atheists call on God when the plane's falling out the sky. <laughs> Because prayer is this alignment with your will and the will of God. So I want to give you four, four real, quick, real quick things and then, we, then, then we'll get out of here. One, prayer is understanding the plan that God has for your life. Now, why is that important? It's important because we have our own plan. And sometimes they're in the will of God, and sometimes they're not. I remember when I was younger, uh, I was at this club, and I saw this little tenderoni. Um, <laughs> you got to be my age, though, the tenderoni was. But anyway, <clears throat> and I'm like, you know, she was so fine. She would, listen, this girl, this girl was so fine, you could drink her bath water, right? And, uh, and I'm saying, God, I kind of like her. And he says, no. She's not right for you. I'm like, but gosh, she's so fine. Why not? He said, because she's not right for you. Listen to me. The word of God says God will not withhold any good thing from you. If he's withholding it, it ain't good for you. But if I shut down that GPS system, I'm going to follow this little tenderoni, which I did. And guess what? Life was so crazy, I could not wait to get out. God, if you ever get me out of this thing. Now, I know you never did that. I know you've never stepped out of God's will. I know you never chased something God didn't want you to have. But as for me and my house, 
<laughs> right? Just because it looks good to you doesn't mean it's good to good for you. And what Jesus is trying to teach the disciples when he says there's a plan and he's teaching them how to pray is there will be times when you think you're in line and something looks like it's God and it's not. And the only way you can discern it is if God says, nope, that's not it. Why? Because God will never lie to you. Another thing about prayer is this. Our prayer is directly connected to how we understand the person to whom we're praying. In other words, we talk to our parents differently than we talk to our kids. You know, your, your kids come in the house and you say, go sit down, don't say anything. They go sit down. Your mama come in the house, you say, go down and sit down. You'll be dead. <laughs> because we respect the boundaries. The problem is, we don't respect the same boundaries with God. Sometimes we just bring God so low that we just think we can talk to him any kind of way we want. But if you really understand the prayer, you recognize he is high and lifted up. And that your responsibility is to constantly exalt him because he really does know better. Because he has to plan. Secondly, when we access prayer, uh, God gives us power, power to discern, power to lay hand, power to change direction, power to invest in the lives of people around us. Thirdly, when we learn how to pray, it becomes persistent. Remember, remember, uh, there's this guy named Noah. How much time do I have? There's this guy named Noah. I don't know if you know him. He built this boat, well, actually an ark, Genesis chapter 6. And um, he's 500 years old, and God says build this, build this ark because it's going to rain. And he's like, rain? There's no such thing. I never heard of rain okay, because it had rain. So he starts building his ark, and it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been that bad if he was near a river, but he wasn't. He was in a desert building a boat. But he starts building a boat. He's telling people, uh, listen, it's going to rain, and God says it's going to rain, and it, it doesn't rain. So 50 years later, this young boy says, uh, Noah, you told my daddy that God told you that it was going to rain. No rain. But Noah keeps building the ark. Sixty years later, a uh, young kid says, you told my granddaddy, who told my daddy, that you told them that God said it was going to rain. No rain. Chapter 7 says, 600 years of his life. He's now 600 years, it's, a year, it's 100 years later, and the rain comes. Everybody on the earth drowns, but eight people. And the only person that Noah could talk to was God. No one else believed him. Sometimes when God tells you something in prayer, it doesn't make sense to everyone else. It doesn't have to make sense to everyone else. It only has to make sense to you. Now, what's interesting about that is this. The ark was not a boat. It didn't have a rudder. It didn't have sails. And it only had one door. You know why? Because it was the coming attractions of the church. Noah could not navigate the boat. And we are supposed to navigate the church. That's God's job. Our job is to pray to make sure we're in alignment with his presence. you got to be persistent even when it doesn't make sense. The fourth thing is this. God confirms our purpose when we pray. And we know that all things work together for good. For those who are, love God and are called according to his purpose. We'll close with this. Your purpose may not be like someone else's purpose. 
Your gifts may not be like someone else's gifts. Your abilities may not be like anyone else. Bishop and I have been friends for over 43 years. I, when I moved to California, I would have him ship me his tapes so I could listen to his messages. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't believe that you know, God was calling me to it, but when God called me to the ministry, I decided I wanted, to go, I wanted to be a professor. But I would listen to his sermons, and I've always loved to hear him hoop. And so one day, I'm in the shower, listening to one of these sermons, and I've heard it so many times that I know he's getting ready to go in. So I decide, not being a singer, to go in with him, I, <gasps> with a mouthful of water and almost drowned in the shower, and God said, I ain't teach you how to do that. That ain't your purpose. Your gifts are not like his gifts. That ain't what I called you to do. And so stop trying to align your purpose with someone else's purpose because it looks good. That ain't what God called you to do. So what have we learned? First of all, that God has a plan for you. And it is to do you good to prosper you not to do you harm but also we know that in the process of God bringing you to your destiny there may be some difficult times because all things do work together even the broken things even the hard things even the scary things even the times when you are alone they can be a part of God's gift to get you where he wants you to be. God bless you.